we're going to start with some of the sun loving perennials um, that really really can take the heat um, daylilies are one of my favorites um, because they tend to um, last for a blue their bloom times are for a very long time throughout the summer months um, most of them, and, and they're coming out with new varieties that are re-bloomers. It used to be that some of the bigger daylilies, they bloomed once and they were done. Um, and then you were just left with the foliage. Uh, but now you have daylilies like uh, the Stella Dior, um, the Everyday or Everyday daylilies um, that are all repeat bloomers. So we're bringing all of those in so you can have some, uh, lilies all year round. And they have beautiful colors and, and all different colors. So you get the reds, um, you, there's yellows, there's pinks, um, purples as well. So they're really, really pretty. While we're on yellow, um, this is another one of my uh, favorites. Um, it, it's Tixie, or also known as Coriopsis. Um, very versatile plant. Um, blooms all summer long. Um, does Most of your perennials do require a little bit of deadheading and deadheading just means you're going to pick off the blooms um, to keep them from going to seed um, because once the plant starts going to seed um, it kind of thinks that um, it's time to finish the year and we're done. So the more you deadhead the more blooms you keep going. Um, when you're doing that towards the end of the season uh, in the fall let them go to seed and then you can sprinkle the seeds wherever you want them and then you can just kind of pro propagate that way when you uh when you're saying spread the seeds do you have to put ground over the seeds or do you just kind of mix it in the soil just or? kind of mix it in the soil wherever you want them just like you would a wildflower seed okay mm -hmm. all right thank you Um, this is an agastache or hummingbird mint. Um, the hummingbirds really, really love it, and it's very appropriately named. Um, these guys come in a variety of different colors. Um, I have reds, purples, pinks, uh, and then the, the orange and the yellow. Um, it, agastache or hummingbird mint. Um, great fragrance and the nice thing about this guy if you guys have critters deer rabbits these guys um javelina too anything with a scent most of your critters are going to leave alone this one is one that we all know and love um this is an autumn sage um, autumn sage is basically a small shrub. Um, he blooms from April till November. Again, the hummingbirds just love this guy, and again, the animals leave him alone. Um, very versatile, very drought tolerant. Um, so if you guys have uh, an area where you don't want to have to water more than once a week, these are perfect for that spot. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, her question was, it, was it, is it the same with all the sages, with the, the, the critters? And the answer is yes. Anything that has an odor to it, usually they'll leave it alone. They don't like that smell. Um, if you notice, if you ever buy like the Repelzol and stuff like that, um, there's usually spice in, in the mix. Um, the Repelzol has cloves, the uh, <coughs> clove oil in there, so that's the smell that they don't like to have. Um, but then, again, this is one of my favorites. Uh, comes in a lot of different colors. Um, reds, whites, pinks, purples. Um, and then there's a, a new salmon color that's really pretty. Coral. A nice plant. Uh, this is a black-eyed Susan um, or a rutabecchia. Um, this is a more of a late 
summer to late fall bloomer. Um, great flowers. Typically, the critters usually leave this one alone um, because of the roughness of the leaf. However, I've seen a rabbit eat some, so kind of be careful with it. Um, and with those lists that we have, animals can't read, so they don't know what's actually on it, but these are pretty predictable things. Like I said, if you keep with the, the ones that have an odor to it or plant strategically, um, you can usually get around keeping the animals away from it. This is another one of my favorite uh, plants. Um, this is Nepeta or Catmint, um, another one that the critters tend to stay away from. Um, really pretty purplish blue uh, color. Uh, they come in a variety of sizes, and I found out from my own gardens that I really like the lower ones, like this cat meow. He only gets in that 12 to 14 inches, um, and, and that's a great size. Um, so the way these guys work is they, they start blooming in April, and then they'll kind of fade out. You need to deadhead, and then they come back. Um, my taller ones, my, my uh, plain cabinet, he's this tall. And when the flowers are so full, he just kind of flops. And so I'm kind of disgusted with him because he, he's just taking up my whole garden, you know, and I can't see my, my um, Shasta daisies and my cauliflowers because he's just taking over that spot. So I think he's gonna get wet. Um, or just move to another spot. Um, so um, kind of when, when you're thinking about your perennials, kind of think of the space that you want to use and kind of it, it does take a, a, a little bit of planning unless you're like me and I, I just find stuff I like and then I find out it's planted in the wrong spot and then it's like okay well we'll just have to remove something and put something else there. Um, but usually if you're planning a new garden, um, think about, do some research, find out how tall things are going to be, um, how wide things are going to be. Um, we're, we're very, we, we like a lot of uh, new things and we tend to crowd stuff. Um, but remember, things are going to grow, maybe not as fast as we want them to. Um, but. They, they will grow and they will take up that space and then all of a sudden everything is like this and then you start having bug problems diseases and stuff like that or things just don't look good and that's because they're the roots are kind of crowding each other and all that stuff did you have a question no, no, okay <laughs> okay okay well then you got dropped um, this is a really pretty plant. Um, this is a Veronica. Um, Veronica is one of those perennials that comes in a ground cover and an upright version. Um, the upright version usually gets in that 14 to 18 inches. Um, the colors are really vibrant. Um, right now I just have this blue one, but this also comes in pinks and whites. Um, blooms through the summer, uh, spring to summer, um, and then it's just going to kind of be a green plant for the rest of the season. What plant is it? Veronica. Oh. This is a Veronica. Does that require a lot of water? Or no? So her question was, does it require water? Um, so watering is a little bit tricky to just say, okay, you're going to water twice a week and that's going to be it because it depends on your condition. Uh, most of us have full sun. Um, some of us have clay soils that tend to hold that moisture longer. Uh, some of us have uh, very porous soils where it just kind of goes straight through. Um, so don't be shy to put a finger in the ground or screwdriver, or piece of rebar, or moisture meter, which we are out of, um, <laughs> um, because each area is a little bit different and depending on our temperatures they vary so much um you know last week we were nice and cool this week we've been 
so, so cool. Um, but next week, we're going to be hot, real, real hot. Um, so probably next week, you might add an extra watering just to keep things hydrated. But be careful with that because it's our nature to just water. Things start kind of wilting. Uh, we just assume it needs water, but sometimes it's okay just to um, um, let them sit for a day. You know, if they come back when it cools off, they're okay. Uh, we kind of all wilt in the afternoons when it's hot, so it's okay for plants to do that as well. I have one question. Yes. So you can take a stick and put it in your plant to see which, how far down the moisture is. So her question was, is um, how far down should you check the moisture? So basically you want to kind of go down as far as you can reach because your root system is down here. Um, the way our sun hits and it's so intense, the top couple of inches is going to dry out pretty much daily. Um, so go down where the roots are and, and, and that's where you want that moisture to level to be. Um, if you're having a lot of drying out um, on the very top, put a nice layer of mulch on there. Just having that mulch on there is going to even out the temperature um, and give it a little bit of relief so it won't completely dry out in between. And you can literally water once or twice a week. No, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, her question was, is should you put the mulch all the way to the plant? And you don't want to butt it up to the plant because then you can get rot and other problems there. Um, so leave about six inches or so away from the plant, but all that dirt that's around it, put the mulch on. And that goes for trees and shrubs and stuff as well. Question. Yes. Can you tell me which are the uh, when you're you're talking about it? Which are the ones that require less water? I mean, do you have any that requires that does well without much water at all? Uh, so her question was to kind of uh, inform you guys of the ones that are more drought tolerant, and and I'll try to remember to mention that. Um, so this is one of them. Um, you will see these guys uh, growing on the side of the road. Um, this one is part of our wildflower mix. Uh, this one's called Mexican hat uh, or Ritibia. Um But I like Mexican hat myself um, because it does look like a sombrero. Um, these guys are very versatile and require very little water. Um, so this would be one that you could put in. Um, yeah, and, and she just uh, added that they do self-propagate. Um, like I said, this is part of our wildflower mix and they will reseed all over the place. And typically my rabbits leave this one alone. Just one more question. Yes, ma'am. Which ones of these perennials do best in larger containers? Uh, her question was, is which ones of these do well in larger containers? Basically all of them would. Um, I mean, I would probably stay away from some of the drought tolerant ones because you're probably going to end up overwatering them unless you know that you're not going to water very often. Um, so like if you were going to plant this, you probably wouldn't water more than once a week. Yes. And that might be too much. So it, it would be, like I said, kind of tricky to a point. Yeah. All right. Um, this is Gara. Um, also, um, before I moved here, I was at a nursery in Colorado, and we actually call this whirling butterflies um, because if you actually look at the flower, it does look like a butterfly. Um, butterflies and hummingbirds love this guy. Um, it is a very drought tolerant one. Again, once a week, once it's established, should be enough for this. What's that called again? Uh, Gara. Yeah, yeah. This one also self-propagates. When you have a fast-draining soil, do you water more often? Yes, 
uh, his question was is if he has a fast draining soil would you water more often and that is yes you would um, so when you go to plant um, you're going to add mulch whether you have clay soil or porous soil that's more granite and, and rocks and stuff um, so the mulch is going to do two things it helps break up the clay and leave a little bit of air pockets so it helps that clay dry out and with the the porous soil the granite uh, soil it, it gives you mo uh, some moisture holding power so it'll help keep that moisture in a little bit more but you'll still probably if, if you drain really quickly you're probably going to water it twice a week yeah Her question was, is with the potted plants, do you use mulch on top? I do, um, because I, like I said, that, that top layer, it, it, it really dries out really fast. They don't get close to the right. plant. Yeah. Excuse me. Can I just ask you how, how uh, long would you water? So her question was, is how long do you water? So that that's a very hard question to ask. So with watering, it's more about volume than how long you're going to water. So what I always tell people, and I sound like I get on a soapbox with this, learn your sprinkler system, your drip system, figure out what kind of emitters you have. Are they one gallons, two gallons, five gallons? Um, most of us have drip systems that are all on one circuit, so everything gets watered all at once, um, which makes it really difficult when you have one perennial and five different trees and three shrubs. It, it makes it diff difficult. So the way we conquer this is with the emitters. So your perennials probably are going to have a gallon, maybe a half gallon, depending on how big they are. Um, your trees, you're probably going to have four or five spaghetti lines with five gallon emitters so you can get that volume of water in that hour's time. Um, so most of, your, most of your emitters are per, so they're gallons per hour. Um, so kind of keep that in mind when you're setting it, your timers and stuff. Um, if most of them are etched, uh, some of them are color coded and I don't remember what colors mean which ones um, but if you go to Home Depot they have all the different emitters and you can figure out which one color is which but, it, but it's pretty universal all the blue ones are whatever they are so. all you have to do is Google yeah and you can Google it yeah. too just Google drip emitters <laughs> and and they have every single color and what it means like for example green is two and a half gallons mm -hmm. that's what I use yeah. so and also you can actually look at the emitters sometimes they're etched with 1.0 or 5.0 so you can check that way too and and the other ones are kind of nice that you can actually adjust them um, they go from one gallon to 14 which is kind of cool they're pricey but they're kind of cool because then you can turn them off and turn them on and you know if you need to change them out it's really easy just to turn that dial okay yes sorry back to the mulch yes um, you said you just use it on containers but you also said keep it six inches away from the plant <laughs> i guess i'm confused okay. well okay you can do that in a so it, it's not set in thank you <laughs> perfect it's not set in stone obviously your smaller plants you, you can put them a little bit closer okay. i mean your trees you know give okay. them a little bit of room okay. um, because you're going to continue to grow um, while i'm talking about continuing to grow make sure a lot of us are new in this area and we've moved into houses that have been there you know trees have been there make sure your emitters are not next to the trunk of your trees they're not doing any good right there. You need to be out. The drip line of any plant is usually where the furthermost branches are. And usually in that eight, like 18 to 24 inches in that area. So if you are watering at the trunk, you're wasting your water. Because it's really not doing anything, but if, unless you have a flower bed there, you're watering your flowers very well. Um, so move your drip lines to the outmost branches and, and your, your trees are going to be much more happier. 
All right. Um, this is a ground cover. Uh, this is creeping phlox. Um, there are several different types of phlox. There's the, the creeping phlox and then there's the, the tall garden phlox. Um, the creeping phlox usually blooms early in the springtime. Um, come in a variety of different colors, uh, blues, uh, bright fuchsia, uh, pinks. Uh, there's actually a striped one as well. Um, they do really well and, and I love them because they actually kind of with all our um, DG and gravel that we have all around our yards, um, having just a pop of green somewhere is really pretty. Um, it, and these guys can get a good size, so give them enough room because you can get a patch about three feet wide. It does. It, she, she mentioned that it looks like trailing rosemary, and it really kind of does. Could I just ask you about Ketonia Esther? I have one and it looks like it's stressed. Does it feed a lot of water, less water? Um, what's your experience? Uh, your question was about Ketonia Esther. Come see me afterwards okay. and I'll ask you a bunch of questions. Okay, we'll try to figure you. out what's sure. going on. Absolutely. All right, so this is yarrow. Um, there are different varieties of yarrow. This one kind of has a finer uh, leaf to it. Um, the moonshine yarrow, which is one of our plants of the month, um, has kind of a thicker, uh, more grayish uh, color leaf. Um, both of them kind of love drought conditions. Um, pretty much their animal, uh, the animals do not like these guys. Um, come in a variety of different colors, like this one's pink. Um, there's a terracotta down there. Um, that's kind of a coppery orange, um, the yellow. Um, there's a couple of them that are multicolored, which is really kind of neat. Um, but these are one of those that kind of give you that green moundy look, but it still has the flowers and such. Uh, this is a more low growing uh, uh, perennial. Um, this one only gets about 14, whereas that moonshine, um, I've seen plants that are like this small. Uh, really, really pretty, but it's about this tall. Uh, so these are very drought tolerant, and um, if you just planted it, I would say probably twice a week. Um, if it's been in your yard more than a year, once a week should be more than enough for it. All right, so this is another uh, ground cover um, that uh, is very, very drought tolerant. Uh, this is called Mediterranean Carpet, and this guy is very, very drought tolerant. Um, really pretty uh, silverish green foliage, um, pretty little purple pink flowers here. Um, you're going to get a nice little mound about yay big. Um, and uh, it's just a great perennial. Um, some of the you folks that just need a filler, something very low in the you know in the front of your areas or your beds, this is a great one for. What's the name of that? Mediterranean carpet. shade loving perennials they still don't mind the heat but they don't like the sun so um, this is a huchera or also known as uh, coral bells um, mostly this plant is all about the leaf color um, these guys come in a different variety of leaf colors so there's a electric lime green um, there's an orange one called I think it's orange marmalade um, there's like hundreds of different varieties. Um, dark purples, the purple obsidian. Um, so if you've got a shady spot, um, this is a great plant for those. Puchera. 
Puchera for Parabell. Um, these are the flowers, which are kind of not to be mentioned. Um, they, they do make little kind of pretty stalks that kind of blow in the breeze, um, but as far as flowers, not so much. <laughs> All right. Um, this is a hosta. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, when you say shade. Half the day shade, all day shade. So most of our plants can do, especially the stuff, and our shade area is all right in front of the store um, for our perennials. So it's under that cover, uh, right in front of the store. And basically, when we think of shade plants, they don't like our hot afternoon sun. Um, so keep that in mind with with with. Um, when you're looking for them. Um, it, it also goes with the shade loving shrubs. Um, we're all looking for those that can't take that afternoon heat. Um, and they're all on the outside of our lower perennial house. Um, also, just one note to remember, when you're reading tags, they make those tags for the whole entire country. Uh, we got to remember, we live in Prescott, Arizona. Um, we have a lot of different conditions here. Uh, one, we are a mile high, so our sunshine is so, so intense. Um, we also have no humidity except for a little bit today, uh, a little bit yesterday. It was muggy. It's like, ah, it's not supposed to be this way. Um, but for the most part, there's no humidity whatsoever here. Uh, so, and, and that's the biggest difference between here and other places. Um, a lot of the things, I moved here from Colorado, and um, most of the plants are the same. It's just that our conditions are totally different, and it's like, ah, I can't grow anything, why? Um, so you have to kind of learn that things are a little bit different. You don't have to water as often as you think you do. Um, and I think that was the biggest one for me. It's like, I'm in a desert, I have to water all the time. And it's not the case. Um, our, our soil, and especially if you mend them when you're planting, you, you can actually get away with once or twice a week. Go ahead. Thank you. You're okay. Um, so this is a hosta. Um, hostas are great for shade. Um, again, um, mostly about the leaves. However, these do have a prettier flower, um, almost like a, a orchid <coughs> or the ostromerias that you see in the store. It kind of has that trumpet-shaped flower. Um, one thing I will note on these is that the snails kind of love these guys. Um, and especially if you have a really shady spot and you keep it nice and moist, you're going to have snails. So be prepared for them. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, would you spell that? I have one. Hosta, H-O-S-T-A. Thank you. That was an easy one. Excuse me, did you say how much water the hosta needs? Uh, once or twice a week. Okay. It kind of depends on your area. And it won't do well in the sun? No. Okay. No sun. So a little bit of morning it could do, but not hot afternoon. Um, this is another shade plant. Uh, this one's a bleeding heart or dicentra. Um, usually blooms early spring to early s summer. Um, little heart shaped flowers, which is kind of where it gets its name. Um, this is a very delicate plant, so it definitely needs as much shade as you can possibly give it. They need indirect light, but a lot of shade. Um, this one is Lily of the uh, Nile, uh, or Agapantha. Um, this one is more of a bulb, I guess, um, but it, it needs the shade as well. Um, gorgeous flowers. Um, they, this one's kind of almost a dark purple. We also have a lighter blue down there, which I think is more typical. Um, shade plant, water a couple times a week. <coughs> Yes. 
Agapantha. 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 So, um, most of your ball type plants um, sometimes need to be heavily mulched in the winter time. And that kind of goes with this one as well. Uh, your canna lilies also are a shade plant. Um, heavily mulch them in the, the winter time. They're, they're just not used to our, you know, a single digit cold temperatures. So you're even worse. Um, so if you have a situation like that, you can always dig it up, put it in your garage, and then bring it back out if you need to. Agapanthus. Uh, this is another um, shade plant. Um, however, I have seen this one in sun a little bit, um, but it doesn't do quite as well. Um, if it's in a shade, it can really kind of take, it's kind of like the vinca vine, it can kind of take over space. I don't think it's quite as invasive as the vinca, um, but it, it's a great ground cover if you just need an area to build in. Um, I love this plant because of the true blue color. You don't get this true blue very often. And so this is a great plant. He blooms most of the summer uh, through fall. So he's a great plant to have just Flamingo, sorry. <laughs> flamingo. I have Flamingo so. And like I said, I've seen them that way. Um, and I think if they get fully established, it's okay. But getting them started, sometimes they do like that. Flamingo. Okay, so we're going to move into a new direction. Um, these guys are more drought tolerant. Um, so uh, in those uh, hot, sunny areas, um, this is Angelina uh, sedum. Um, ground cover, she'll, she'll get about this big. A uh, nice little mound. Um, they do bloom uh, flowers later on in the fall. Um, but it has this great uh, lime green and orange color to it. And there's like a hundred different types of sedums and such. Uh, so, and they're all right over here in the high desert area. Uh, so if you have a hot spot, I, I do recommend it. Hot, sunny area. Hot, sunny area. Um, this is an Autumn Joy uh, stone crop. Um, this is another succulent. Um, has a little bit different leaf structure, uh, more upright, um, gorgeous flowers uh, later summer into fall. Um, so it's a, another great one that doesn't mind being hot and dry. So that's a hardy succulent? Yes. What was the name? Uh, Autumn Joy Seed Crop or Stone Crop. It was uh, her question was how tall, um, usually in that 12 to 14 inch range, but they're more one of the taller ones. Uh, a lot of the seed or stone crops are more ground cover-ish. Um, and this is one that we all kind of know and love. Uh, this is the gopher plant. Um, this is a beautiful plant. Um, in the early spring, it blooms these chartreuse yellow flowers. Um, very, very drought tolerant. Uh, once a week is more than enough for them, um, and, and they're really, really easy to grow. What's that name again? Uh, uh, gopher plant. Gopher. gopher. And that's hardy? It is hardy. Okay, because I've seen hardy doesn't grow well, but I've seen them they have them all over. Yeah. I bring it to you, not hardy plant. So, you have to kind of be careful with, with bringing stuff here because they do need, we are a zone seven uh, for anybody that doesn't know. And, and yeah, if you're up in Groom Creek or up higher, you're definitely a six. So with the hardiness zones, if you're not aware, um, the lower the number, the more cold tolerant it can be. Um, so look for the lowest number that you can get. Um, what is as far the hardiness? Top four, five? It, it's a six. If any would like to see a picture of the large 
There's actually one across the street that's probably five feet in diameter. All right. Let's talk shrubs. Um, shrubs, because we're talking about um, things that love the heat, I, I have some beautiful shrubs that I want to share with you. Um, and some of them only start their thing in the heat of the summer. Um, roses really start showing their stuff at this time of year. Um, and we just got a new truckload, so I had to show them off. Um, so, um, Easy Elegance uh, is a brand that Bailey's Nursery kind of came up with. Um, and they do uh, very good roses. Um, all different kinds of heights as far as what they're doing. Um, so kind of read the tag as far as, you know, if you want to try to find the right size for your area. Um, some of them are more like carpet roses that are going to stay in that three by three range. Um, some of them are shrub roses size, so they're going to get like five by five. Um, all different colors, uh, sizes of roses. Uh, so enjoy them. Roses do very, very well here. And this one's called Music Box, by the way. Um, this is Paint the Town, and, and this just grabbed me this morning. So really beautiful colors. Um, if you have a spot that needs some bright colors, this will do it for you. Are they better in the ground? Or the ground? Uh, her question was, is our roses better in the ground or in a pot? It depends on your watering. Um, roses do not like their feet wet. Um, so if you're very careful water and would rather let it go dry than keep it wet, it'll do just fine in a pot. Um, if you tend to overwater, probably in the ground is going to be better for it. All right. Excuse me. Yeah. You didn't mention any of the shade. Because not too many, her, her question was, is that um, she, I didn't mention any animal resistance as far as the shade shrub. A lot of them are not. Um, Vinca is one of them. I think the plumbago is also another one that is very tolerant. Okay, so I just got a confirmation that happily leave the plumbago alone. So, um, other than that, um, I know the deer love the hostas, um, the huge cheras, I'm sure the bleeding heart would be just like breakfast. Um, so kind of be careful with, with your shade plants. It, all right. Alrighty. Crepe myrtles. Um, so I have like eight different varieties right now of crepe myrtle. And the reason we have them now is they're, they're one of the last shrubs to actually come out of dormancy. Um, usually, first part of June, last part of May, you'll just start seeing them pop up. Uh, same goes with the Rosa Sharon. They're, they're one of the last ones to really kind of start doing their thing. Um, so these guys love the heat. Uh, as soon as the summer heat comes in, they start blooming. Um, uh, I love these purple leaves. Um, they're just very attractive. Um, these guys are all going to be deciduous. So that means they're going to lose their leaves. Um, with this purple leaf color, they come in a variety of different colors. So you get pinks. This one's actually an orange color, which is spectacular. Um, there's pinks and purples. Um, read the tag because there's so many different variations of sizes. Um, some of them are uh, in that 5x5, five five. some of them get 8 to 10, some of them even 10 to 12. So what is this called? Crate myrtle. And animals don't like those? No. These are not animal resistant. Oh, yeah. So you'll have to figure out that. Or you can use repels all or small fence or put them in the backyard. Where it's fenced in. This is another crepe myrtle. Um, this one's called Bellini Grape, which is kind of a really cool name. Um, 
he uh, is a three to four footer, um, so he's kind of a nice medium sized shrub. Um, gorgeous. Um, her, her question is uh, what happens in the winter time? They all lose their leaves and usually they'll die back to the ground. So in the spring you just kind of chop them down when they come back up from there. Uh, kind of like a butterfly bush, you kind of cut those down uh, every spring and keep them kind of maintained if they pop up. They're this <laughs> tall already. Um, it's plum magic. Um, it kind of has a greenish purple leaf. Um, purple flower color. Um, this is one of the bigger ones, so it kind of gets in that 8 to 10 foot range. But what did you think it was? This, these are all crepe myrtles. Oh, they're all? Yes. Oh, okay. uh, purple magic. Purple. Yeah. The, the, the little one is the Bellini gray. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All famous butterfly bush. Um, these are another shrub that kind of comes in all different shapes and sizes. Um, right now we have three different types. Um, we have uh, the pugsters that kind of get in that two to three foot range. Um, there are the um, uh, buzzes um, that kind of stay in the five foot range and then the regular ones that are going to kind of stay in that uh, eight, six to eight. Um, all different colors, uh, pinks, purples, whites. Uh, there is a yellow one that's really hard to find but we always keep an eye out for it. Um, it's really, really pretty. I do not. Um, but, um, this is the one that you can have in your yard uh, because the animals don't like it. Um, Havelina deer, rabbits, all leave this guy alone. And they love the sun. Uh, butterflies, like I said, love this plant. Uh, bees, if you have a garden, kind of put it next to your garden and bring your pollinators and stuff. Like that great. <laughs> I've seen plants that were full sun and shade, and they, they really don't do, I mean, you, you don't get the flowers like you do in regular time. Last but not least is our old favorite Russian sage. Yeah. Um, this is a great pollinator, loves the heat, it's gorgeous. Um, when you go to plant something like this, he is very aggressive. Um, he will take over an area rather quickly. Um, so if you have a back quarter, you just kind of want to fill up. This is a perfect plant for you um, because they will take over um, and are kind of hard to kill if you try to. Um, very drought tolerant. Animals stay away from it. Um, really good plant. Um, they also come in a couple of different sizes. Uh, there's the crazy blue, lacy blue. Uh, those kind of are more dwarf varieties. Um, if you want those a little bit closer to your yard, um, we're seeing that they're not quite as aggressive as the original Russian sage, so they don't pop up everywhere. I imagine they will, but yeah. they're not as aggressive. That's good for container. I imagine you could just don't overwater it. Um, eventually, it'll outgrow that container sure. for sure. Okay. So I think I've gone through my plants. Um, just wanted to kind of yes. Oh, thank you. I didn't look down. I got another one under. Uh, so this is just the uh, uh, a potentia, a great shrub. Um, for the most part, everything leaves this guy alone. Um, I love this guy because he basically blooms uh, from early summer all up through fall. Um, he is deciduous, so he will lose his leaf. Uh, so February, March, just kind of go through, give him a nice little haircut, shave him up, he'll, he'll be right back free. <laughs> 
Excuse me? Why does the oleander do in this climate? It's drought common, but I yeah, I haven't seen There's them. a reason you haven't seen them. Uh, her question was about oleanders, and, and I, I love oleanders myself. I wish they were hardy here, um, but they're zone 8. So they're, if you have a sunny southern exposure, you might be able to get away with it, um, mulch it really heavily. Um, however, if we drop because zone 8 can go down to like 15, zone 7 can go down to 0, so that's kind of the temperature difference. And we're, we're, we're actually a 7. Um, if you're up in Bird Creek or higher, you know, in the mountain areas, you're probably a 6. It's on. Yeah. Um, I missed the perennial while I was talking about shrubs. Um, this is the blanket flower. Um, he is a perennial. Um, he also goes to seed very easily. Um, very drought tolerant. Um, he's another one that as fall comes, let him go to seed and you can scatter those as well. Um, and you can propagate that way. All right. As far as planting, um, it's just like anything else. Uh, you want to dig the hole twice as wide, just as deep. Um, two thirds natural soil, one third mulch, and uh, then water it in with our root and grow, um, which is a root stimulator and a stress reducer. Um, and that'll, especially this time of year, anytime you're planting, use that root and grow because the stress. Because it's so hot, it's hard to get things going in June. Um, pests and diseases, we had a whole class on it last week. I'll just touch base on it uh, real quick. Uh, water's multipurpose is great for any type of insects that you may have. Uh, between aphids, thrip, which is still around, which I'm kind of surprised with. Usually once the heat starts up, they kind of disappear. Um, blister beetles are rampant right now. Um, so kind of keep an eye on them. They're little gray and black bugs that are spotted and you'll know if you have them because they'll just wipe out a plant. Um, we're starting to see some fungal things start up, uh, so kind of keep an eye on that. Um, you have powdery mildew and, and black spots are starting to show up. Um, yes, caterpillars are out. Um, and, and like grape vines, or we're starting to see the skeletonizers. Uh, so kind of keep an eye on your garden. It's really, really important to pay attention to it. You know, um, the, the faster you catch something, the easier it is to get rid of. Uh, yes, sir. Correct. Correct. Yes. Uh, the multi-purpose spray will take care of that. Uh, spray it often. I still have them. They're, they're eating my apricot tree right now. And our rose bush. And, and his rose bush. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly the yellow. I'm actually spraying them all the time. A week. Okay. Yes, they're there. Uh, you know, I, I turn around and, and and they kind of blow in with the wind. Um, so you know, you might spray the tree and yeah, do it in the evening. Anytime you spray it, and you'll be better it, because it, it'll allow it to soak in. Um, the multi-purpose spray and the triple action uh, leave a residue, which is good. So when things eat, they can do that. Um, so yeah.